Yes, thank you, Ashley. Really interesting also the, the, the redistribution, uh, redistribution of the burdens and, uh, and the benefits also relates to the, well, the people, but also the ecology. So uh, interesting. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Vittorio uh, Negrete. Negreta? To? Ta? <laughs> Uh, thank you, Arian. You almost <laughs> got that right. <laughs> that will be Vittore Negretto. Thank you. Vittore Negretto. Yes. And um, he's going to tell about the uh, Venezia Lagoon, right? And yes. the shipping channel there. Yes. Thank you. And uh, well, let me first thank you uh, for the kind invitation in this symposium and also for having all the speeches in English so that I could access all the knowledge. However, I'm going to speak in Italian right now. <laughs> Laguna di Venezia. No, so. Um, Okay, so, um, well, uh, Venice and its lagoon, the perspective is the one from especially the shipping channels. And uh, I am based in the University of Venice, the UF, uh, and I'm a researcher there, mainly focusing on planning and climate change. The focus of this small speech will be exclusively on uh, the Venice Lagoon as a portal system and um, focusing on its natural and man-made modifications. So when being asked about talking about the past of Venice, that will be a very long speech, but this, let's focus specifically on this. And uh, please forgive me if environment will, be, will be, not be mentioned too much, but that's for a matter of time. So we'll see the past role, um, current uses and future challenges. So um, why Venice developed where it is? Uh, we're in the northern Adriatic Sea, pretty shallow, and um, the, the Venice is a uh, floating city, and it has in its uh, blood, let's say, in its heart, the navigation. Uh, there are different routes. Uh, from the ancient uh, Rome system, we see that the, the, the most favorite one was their inner coastal one. So a route that could go from Ravenna to Altino, uh, and, uh, and Aquileia, um, all into the coast, so channels and wetlands in a way that could be uh, navigated through all, the, all weathers all year long and, street, and connected to cities and the road infrastructure too. But there's also um, um, a major uh, role of fluvial navigation, so obviously you are aware of it and we've been speaking the whole day, but getting goods, people, and getting connection with inland through rivers um, and this is also connected to the Po River, so getting to Milan and Turin into the um, Padania flatland, that would say in English probably. Apart from that, um, there's obviously navigation inside the lagoon and that help for any kind of um, transportation of, of, on a daily basis. Um, and in one of the four corners of the scenarios that we've seen for the future of Rotterdam, one of them is uh, the small archipelago of island. Well, uh, maybe you want to look into Venice, uh, and I won't advise that, actually. <laughs> Lastly, it's the connection with the sea. The, the connection between the sea and the lagoon is accessed through three different um, points of access, three uh, mouths, lagoon mouths. The northern one, the Lido, uh, is mainly used for touristic um, ships. So it's the one directly connected to Venice and, um, and to the, um, yeah, mainly to the city of Venice for touristic uses. The middle axis is the one that gets to the industrial port that will be Marghera. Uh, and that's, um, yeah, it's quite a pretty recent channels I will see. And lastly, the southern one is connected to Chioggia and that is mainly um, for fisheries and that's the main uh, northern Adriatic market for fish. If we take a look at marine traffic, we, we can see how this is, uh, how can we recognize these patterns? Uh, the northern one, the northern axis, you see that has incoming ships from coastal and touristic places along the coast. So many routes and going along the coast. Whereas the middle one has two main um, routes, high sea routes, coming of cargo ships and bulk and containers. Uh, and uh, you can recognize also the waiting areas outside the port to wait the, the right moment to get into the lagoon. Whereas the last axis uh, is the one connected to fishing, we said. So many vessels coming from a big area, and that's where the um, fishing takes place, and then back to Kyoja. 
But, um, well, um, the lagoon uh, also seen a lot of evolution throughout the years and the century. This is a picture from, uh, this is a map from the 15th century, and that's the moment in which the Serenissima Republic was um, worried about the, all the sediments coming from um, 27 different um, rivers coming into the lagoon, and so bringing sediments and uh, filling up the lagoon. So uh, since then, uh, this is a, a map from the engineer Sabadino, um, and it's been so many rerouting of rivers outside the lagoon, uh, especially to prevent the filling, but also there's been a lot of canal dredging and coastal protection. So these are the main human interventions in the lagoon. Um, well, skipping toward the last century, but you still can see the differences in between the left and the right, um, especially on certain aspects. For example, on the left, you can see that there's a network of branching channels, and that is a typical partner for uh, tide, tidal um, lands. Um, whereas in, in, in the more recent picture, in the more recent map, you see that there's fewer um, channels and deeper one. And these have obviously been dredged through the years. Um, well, from the, the, the borders of the lagoon were once more uh, accommodating water and uh, giving space for water to expand uh, during high tides, whereas in the, in the more recent picture, uh, borders have been, um, I've seen a lot of development for, for urban development, but also industrial one. And um, but also the inlets uh, have changed throughout the years. Uh, focus on the northern one that we said, the one not, uh, more uh, near to the lagoon. Um, and you'll see that throughout the centuries, uh, the modifications of uh, the lagoon has been both for um, natural processes of erosion and sedimentation, but also a lot by man-made infrastructure. For example, you see in the very last two pictures, how dikes and then finally the, the Moses system, this dike system, has shaped and fixed the, sh the shape once for all. All these, um, you're gonna take a picture? Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> um, so uh, changing in the routes uh, also means, and channels have effect on what happens on land for sure. So I'll, I'll uh, navigate you, uh, sorry for navigation, uh, through three different areas um, where this change of the route change have, have also make changes on land. For example, uh, the Arsenale, um, this is the historic shipyard, uh, which uh, gradually fell in disuse for all the big, all, all the transformation in ships. Uh, we've been talking about bigger ships, in this case was the transformation from wooden to iron one, but uh, depth and dimension and, and weight of ships uh, gradually um, put out the arsenale from this market, but it's been converted uh, throughout the years. Uh, we've been mentioning the Biennale of Venice, and this is um, part where part of it is held. And uh, well, um, let's say rather than ironically, romantically, this is still the, the place of the, the heart of the defense of Venice, that it used to be the fleet, the Navi fleet, and now it's the operational headquarter of this spike system, the um, upper part of the picture. Well, mentioning um, channels and lagoon uh, and Venice, we cannot uh, avoid to talk about also cruises. Um, this, is, um, this is actually the right place to talk about it. <laughs> Uh, as you can see, this uh, big white uh, ship peeking into the historical city of Venice, this disproportion in between dimensions, and you can see in the bottom picture, uh, dimension of the city and this um, um, incredibly high and big uh, ships has been uh, a matter of cont contestations for decades. And uh, as one gradually be became bigger, um, consultation uh, were also obviously more stronger, but it, we had to get to the to avoid a disaster to actually have something changing. Uh, we said before that disaster is one of the main forces to change, and so we had we almost got there, a small one and an avoided one. But when the state got in, 
and um, could overcome all the economical uh, interests uh, that were connected to cruises uh, and the shipping port. Oh yeah, uh, almost there. Um, and, and how did it overcome all of this? With a declaration of San Marco and the island of Giudecca as a national monument, a moment, monument of um, national interest, relevance. And through this kind of protection, they were able to also uh, ban um, the route in front of San Marco, the cruises one, for ships over certain weight, length, and height. I don't know exactly how many waffles are about 25 tons. <laughs> I will look it up. Uh, but to give you an idea, the SS Rotterdam cannot enter anymore there um, as a dimension. Um, obviously, what used to be the passenger terminal in Venice, so the end of a route of through the San Marco Basin, what we see in the picture, pretty busy, um, also had an impact. Um, and, and it, and it um, well, give the start to a different, uh, to, to the exploration of different options that cyclically uh, come over again. Uh, first picture is what it used to be, second picture is an offshore port, third picture is uh, dredging of a new canal that then been uh, avoided for environmental reasons, and the last one is what is actually happening right now. So. Cruises going through another, the mouth access, the industrial one, uh, and having the passenger terminal in the industrial, so reconverting part, part of industrial port. And this gives also space for development inland. So where the passenger terminal was before, now we're seeing a lot of project of real estates, Hilton Hotel and other accommodation facilities. Good or bad, I'll leave it at your, um, uh, taste in uh, real estate. Um, last slide, that will take 30 minutes. Um, Moses system, so it's a, it's a dike system of rising gates. And this is obviously in Venice, two big pressure. One is coming from tourism, the other one is coming from high tides. And that is a high tide uh, public transport sitting on land. That is not a shipping route, uh, usually. <laughs> Um, and so this uh, protection uh, that costs two billions uh, and more uh, is based on tide forecast. Uh, we are still understanding the right threshold, but that means uh, that it has to be lifted uh, very often, especially in a sea level rise scenario. Uh, right now, there's already nine to 10 centimeters of sea level rise, 10 centimeters of subsidence. And the threshold that we talking about is very short. We talked this morning and we said, oh, but 30 centimeters from glaciers melting is not a problem. Here, it will make the difference in between elevating and blocking the four river mouth, the uh, four lagoon, three lagoon mouths from a few days uh, a year to 80 to 100 days a year. So you can understand the consequences for this for navigation. Safe docks allow ships. Uh, obviously, it has consequences also from the ecological point of view, oxygenation, water quality, and so on. But I won't get into that. Uh, I've left a couple of references just to deepen the topic if you wish, but uh, also uh, any curiosity, uh, let's have a drink together in a short while. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you.